Uh, my assignment uh, is to speak on what it means to be human, and I'm going to do my best not to overlap very much with my decade-long colleague, uh, John Kilner, um, uh, and I don't think that'll be a problem. There's lots and lots and lots to cover. Uh, so uh, I want to speak with you and uh, for you, to you, and what it means to be human. And I have to begin by confessing uh, this afternoon that my reflections on what it means to be human have been refracted through the prism of caring for my father, uh, who suffered from dementia before he died last February. Being with dad every day for several years, and then especially this last year, gave me a lot of time to think about what it means to be human. Because he is or was, I never know what the right tense is, he, because he is my father. Uh, I know that my perspective is biased. So I want us to think about what it means to be human in a slightly different way, which I hope will be less biased by experience, but no less informed by it. But before I do, I want to contrast my perspective with two standard models. The first standard model of what it means to be human is the Enlightenment model, and the second is the medical model. So first, the standard Enlightenment model. And I begin with the Enlightenment model of human personhood because it's the most perva pervasive in Western culture, and I think we can find ample evidence of that claim in many places, from Charles Taylor's magisterial volume, the Secular Age to Carl Truman's more recent volume, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. But two historical examples will su suffice to, I think, I think, legitimate the claim that I'm making about the pervasive nature of the Enlightenment model. In his brief, but I believe disproportionately influential treatise, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, English philosopher and physician John Locke define what it means to be a human person in the following way. To be a human person for Locke is to be, quote, a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and is, it seems to me, essential to it. Now, every adjective is important. The criterion for personhood includes existence as a thinking, intelligent being possessing self-consciousness in a variety of times and in a variety of places. Or to put it another way, for Locke, a human person is an individual rational self who is consciously aware of her conscious awareness as a thinking self over time. Now, let me just, let me just illustrate it this way. Think of yourself thinking right now. You can do it, right? You qualify. Um, you are a human person. Now, let's add to that definition the definition of Immanuel Kant, his criterion for human personhood. At the heart of Kant's moral philosophy is the idea that human persons are rational, autonomous agents. That is, they are thinking, willing selves. In his groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, he puts it this way. Every rational being exists as an end in himself and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. So human, human persons are ends in themselves and not means to other persons' ends. Beings whose existence depends not on our will but on nature have nevertheless, if they're not rational beings, so for those who are not rational beings, they have only a relative value as a means and are therefore called things. On the other hand, rational beings are called persons inasmuch as their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves. 
So those beings which are rational beings are ends in themselves and should not be treated as means to someone else's ends, but those beings which are not autonomous, self-directed, rational individuals are neither persons, nor do we have the same duties toward them. They are merely things. Kant famously argued that our duty not to harm animals unnecessarily was only an indirect duty. If we countenance unnecessary harms to non-rational beings, he maintained, it would desensitize us and tempt us to harm rational autonomous beings, treating them as means to our ends. And so, and so he makes an argument in his 1798 anthropology from a pragmatic viewpoint, that, uh, the, the, the following argument. He says, the fact that the human being can have the representation I, so I identify, I self-identify as a conscious I. The representation I raises him, him infinitely above all the other beings on earth. By this, he is a person. That is, a being altogether different in rank and dignity from things such as irrational animals, with which one may deal and dispose at one's discretion. So rational animal, uh, <coughs> excuse me, non-rational animals are things and one may treat them as one wishes except for the caveat that in doing so that may desensitize us and, and allow us to treat um, human beings, uh, human persons uh, as uh, means to ends rather than ends in themselves. Now, the many good things Lockean and, and Kantian thought have bequeathed to the West, and I, I think there are many good things. I'm afraid their anthropology has not been entirely salutary and beneficial. In fact, I would argue that the view of the human person as an autonomous, rational, expressive individual has been extremely detrimental in politics, in culture, in education, in health care, and religion, from creation care to discipleship to the liturgy in our churches, and yet it's the air we breathe and the water in which we swim. Apart from that, it's fine. In biology and medicine, for instance, we've seen that this perspective threaten vulnerable human beings at what the late Christian ethicist Paul Ramsey called the edges of life. Uh, what do we say of the unborn human being who has not yet developed, quote, reason and reflection and can not consider it, uh, itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, quote Locke? <coughs> or what of the human being who's in a chronic coma and has lost the representation I, can no longer think of themselves as a thinking self? to quote Kant, or quite apart from the preborn or the PVS patient, what happens in the case of dementia when, as Scottish theologian and registered nurse John Swinton puts it, one can no longer remember either self or God? What do, we, what, what do Christians say of the person who can no longer contemplate God, can no longer know God. Did my dad cease to be a human person because of his dementia? Could my dad not be a Christian because he couldn't know God as an autonomous, rational self who was aware of his own conscious uh, self over time? different times and different places. People employ, many people employ the Enlightenment model in one form or another to justify abortion, infanticide, assisted suicide, euthanasia, and other harms to persons. That brings me to the standard medical model. Briefly, st briefly stated, the standard medical model is that what makes human beings distinct from other animals is higher cortical function. The standard definition of dementia, for instance, is, quote, a syndrome due to disease of the brain, usually of a chronic or progressive nature, 
in which there's a, dis a disturbance of multiple higher cortical functions, including memory, thinking, orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning capability, language, and judgment. Now, notice that this distinction defines dementia as a pathology of the brain and that the pathology results in a diminished or diminishing higher cortical function. In his, in his really, uh, I think, uh, extraordinarily helpful and, and insightful volume, Dementia, Living in the Memories of God, Swinton puts it this way. Here we must note that to indicate that acquiring dementia includes one's, sorry, includes losing one's higher cortical function is a much deeper and altogether more alarming statement than it might, than might first appear. Hidden in the midst of this apparently objective and scientific statement is the subliminal suggestion that people with dementia are losing those aspects of being human which are perceived as more important than the other capacities humans might have. They're losing that which society prizes. You, you, you saw the list. Memory, thinking, orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning capability, language, judgment. They're losing that which society prizes. Receiving such a diagnosis puts people in a tricky position which has both neurological and social implications. And then, and then he says this, definitions are not value neutral. Often they are value forming. We need to be able to, to assess and uh, account for uh, the value forming aspects of our definitions. According to Swinton's argument in the book, this approach presupposes that there's a straightforward linear connection between brain pathology and the behaviors and experiences that we choose to name as dementia. Naming is an important function. Adam named the animal. And while I don't have time to unpack all of Swinton's helpful insights here, and there are many, one of those germane to our topic is that Western liberal cultures including the institution of medicine, imbibe the notion that a life which is truly valuable and worth living is fundamentally defined by the ability to function effectively on the level of intellect and reason, or what ethicist Stephen Post calls hypercognition. We value cognition to the degree that, that it's it's one of those superpowers, cognition. To summarize then, when combined, the Enlightenment model and the scientific model end up defining what it means to be a human person as the, ra the rational, self-determining, expressive, individual, higher functioning brain in a vat. It is to define the human person basically as a brain on a stick. This is what Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith calls thinking thingism. That we are thinking things. And what it means to be human is primarily to be a thinking thing. And we value thinking above all other aspects of our humanity. So to lose our capacity to think, to be rational autonomous, expressive individuals and self-conscious uh, individuals, to lose that is to lose our very humanity. Or not to have gained it is not to have gained our humanity. I believe there's a better model. And John, in his address, uh, alluded to it, but I want to, I want to take it in a slightly different direction. The better model uh, is a model that addresses what it means to be human based on our Christology. We often begin our thinking about what it means to be human from the Genesis account. And, and after all, that's Scripture's first revelation of, of when and how God made humanity. And there's, there's a lot there, as we heard already. And so let me say clearly, I think it's good and right to begin there. We learn from Genesis that human persons are made in the image and likeness of God. But we're not told much about what that means. 
James Leo Garrett, Jr., my former professor, friend, and theological icon here at Southwestern Seminary, points out in his systematic theology that there are no fewer than eight different perspectives on the content of the Imago Dei. The last, the last of those eight being various composites. So you have, it, it could be rational, it could be, it could be willing, it could be social or relational, uh, and, then, and then people bring all, all of those aspects or attributes together in composites. So, uh, there are probably more than eight views now. And uh, how, how many possible composites of those, of those multiple views must there be? But many of those views, as John alluded in his talk, many of those views de uh, describe various functions of the Imago Dei. Uh, we, d we define the Imago Dei in terms of functional capacities, uh, like some of the attributes of God himself, reason, will, sociability. But remember the Enlightenment and medical models. What do we say of those living members of the species, Homo sapiens, like living human embryos or like Alzheimer's patients who've, who, who've either never possessed or have lost those functions? What do we say of them if we define the Imago Dei in terms of functional capacities? And this is one of the reasons I think Imago Dei is better understood as an ontological status rather than a set of functional capacities. God declared that human, humanity and human beings were, uh, are his image bearers, um, uh, and that doesn't uh, reduce to a certain set of functional capacities. In other words, what it means to be human is not what humans do, but, what, but who humans are. There's another way for Christians to understand what it means to be human, though. Someone, and probably many, and I'm not sure who, who originally said it, but someone has wisely said that our Christology should inform our anthropology. That is, the clearest lens through which to see what it means to be human may not be in Genesis, but in Jesus. The clearest lens through which, through, through which to see what it means to be human may be the God-man, now, that's not to disparage Genesis, it's to exalt Jesus as the, 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 the image of the living God. So for the remainder of my brief time, I want to focus on three particular aspects of what it means to be human through the lens of the incarnate Christ. First, human beings are necessarily embodied. In the January 2000 issue of the medical journal Pediatrics, a team at the Boston University Division for Behavioral and Developmental Pediatrics reported on a study that they had done with 30 mothers and their newborn infants and the problem of pain. They divided the infants into two groups. Half of the mothers held their babies in whole body skin to skin contact while doctors performed the standard heel prick procedure to draw blood samples. The other half of the babies were wrapped in receiving blankets uh, and, and placed in a bassinet while the blood was drawn. Babies in contact with their mothers, this won't surprise us, but it's interesting, babies in contact with their mothers grimaced 65 percent less than the swaddled babies in the bassinet, and get this, their crying time, the, the, the crying time of the babies that were held skin to skin against their mother was a remarkable 85% less. You see, embodiment matters. And it matters at the other end of life, too. The, the nursing literature is full of references to therapeutic touch. Imagine, imagine that something so, so common and something so human as touch is now seen as a therapy. When you think about it, it makes perfect sense, though. No other part of us comes in contact with that which is not us, but our skin. Think about that. Think about that. No other part of us comes in contact with that which is not us, but the skin. Our skin weighs 6 to 10 pounds, some of us more, some of us less. It's the largest organ of the body. It covers an area of about 22 square feet, some of us more, some of us less. 
and it renews itself about once a month. It's a remarkable, remarkable organ. Our skin imprisons us, but it also gives us shape. It protects us from invaders. It cools us down and heats us up as needed. And think about how many metaphors in our common language are steeped in the metaphor of touch. We say something touches me. Or we say, you know, he's kind of touchy today. And problems can be thorny or ticklish or sticky or need to be handled with kid gloves or are only skin deep. Embodiment matters. The church's early confession at Nicaea in 325 A.D. was that they believed in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. From up for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. The church understood that to be human was to be embodied because Christ, the God-man, Christ, God with us, Christ, Emmanuel, is embodied. It's also clear from what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I wish I had time to, to expound the whole, the whole uh, uh, section, but, but just, just remember what he says in, in, in chapter 4 and 5. We have this treasure, the treasure of the gospel, he says. We have this treasure in jars of clay. He's referring to bodies. Go back and look at the text. He's referring to bodies. What do we know about jars of clay? We know that they're fragile. We know that they're temporary. Uh, we, we know that, we know that they won't always exist, jars of clay. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We're afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we live, uh, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Listen to the, listen to the references to the body. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And then he goes on to say in, in chapter 5, For we know that if this tent, this temporary dwelling place, if this tent that is our earthly home, he's talking about our body, if this tent which is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent... We groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we're still in this tent, we groan. This is the groaning stage. It's okay to groan, it's okay to lament. It's okay to wish for more because more is coming. Listen to what he says. For while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed. Paul's not, Paul's not wishing for a day in which he will be a, a disembodied spirit. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who's prepared us for this very thing uh, is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And I, 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 won't, I won't go on, uh, but you continue reading uh, what, what he says there. The apostle wasn't longing for some disembodied state as a rational, autonomous, expressive, conscious self. He was longing for a body. By the way, the Bible is a very... A, 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 a very sensory book. There's all kinds of 
things in the Bible about touch and taste and sight and smell and, and hearing. It's a sensory book. And Jesus washed feet, not brains. There's only one way to be human. And that's to be embodied. And if we are embodied, then secondly, we are limited. Human persons are necessarily limited, finite creatures. This is one of the aspects of being human that tends to annoy us. I, I, I thought, you know, I just want to see what the synonyms for limitation are in, in the dictionary. And all of them are disparaging. If you look up limitation, you get, you get synonyms like this. Restriction, impediment, obstacle, deterrent, clamp down, imperfection, flaw, defect, failure, shortcoming. But the reality is because we are embodied... We are limited. Because we are embodied, we have to use television technology to be present in a meeting sometimes because we can't be both there and here at the same time. We are limited by, by time and space. The reality is human beings are necessarily finite beings. As my friend Gilbert Mylander has put it in, in the title of his book on human dignity, we are neither beast nor God, but we want to be God. We want to live lives without limitation, and we try, much to our detriment. We're finite. We're particular. We're limited and located in space and time. Finitude, creaturely finitude is not a sin. And creaturely finitude is not the result of sin. Creaturely finitude is the gift of God to his creatures. After all, he became incarnate through the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. He was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried in his body. In his extraordinary volume, You're Only Human, How Your Limits Reflect God's Design and Why That's Good News, theologian Kelly Capick, among other things, explores the work of one of the great African theologians of the past, Tertullian of Carthage. And he explores his essay against the, Mar the Marcionites, De Carne Christe, uh, on the flesh of Christ. Let us examine request Tertullian our Lord's bodily substance. For about his spiritual nature, we're all agreed. He assumes that they agreed that Christ is spirit or spiritual, but he wanted to inquire about their understanding of his earthly nature, his bodily substance. This is one of the great questions, of course, that the early church faced. What does it mean to confess that God was made human. And for us, I think similarly, it is what do we learn from the incarnation about ourselves? What shall we say of our Lord's bodily existence and what it means for us? Well, first of all, it means that Jesus was embodied from conception in Mary's uterus. We know that more clearly than ever through technology today, but, but, but they knew it in Jesus' day too. Just read Luke 1.39 and following the encounter between Elizabeth and Mary and what happens in the, in the womb. They understood. Luke, the doctor, understood uh, something of what was going on in the womb. Jesus was born a helpless baby who longed to be held against his mother's body, skin to skin. Jesus was limited in time and place. In his, earthly, in, in his earliest days, he was limited in, in, in time and place in a cattle stall in Bethlehem. He had skin, a vascular system, cardiac function with blood pressure and a pulse that he could have seen on his Apple Watch if he had one. Later, he worked with hands, human hands. He cut himself, got splinters, bled human blood. He sweated 
human sweat. He got tired over time. He got hungry. He needed sleep. He went fishing. He went through puberty. He grew facial hair and began to smell like other teenage boys, human teenage boys. He had bad breath, human bad breath. Surely, surely this is at least part of what St. John means when he exclaims, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And why in the same gospel account the people question Jesus' deity and ask, isn't, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? They couldn't question Jesus' humanity because he was limited by his embodiment just as they were. But we, we tend to treat those limits as if they're either obstacles or extraneous to our humanity rather than necessary to it. We are brains on a stick instead of embodied creatures with all of the attributes of creaturely embodiment. Capic reads our text messages when he says this. The odd thing is that even when we run into our inevitable limits, we often hang on to the delusion that if we just work harder, if we simply squeeze tighter, if we become more efficient, we can eventually gain control. We imagine we can keep our children safe, our income secure, and our bodies whole. When I complain about getting older, my wife sometimes laughs and says to me, you have two options, you're either getting older or you're dead. Denying your finitude, sorry, denying our finitude cripples us in ways we don't realize, it also distorts our view of God and what, Christianity, and what Christian spirituality should look like, says Capic. Not just distorts our view of what Christian spirituality should look like, but what our very humanity should look like. For instance, Capic points out the average day for high school students who follow this kind of schedule. Leave home for school around 6.30, attend class until 3.30, Immediately go to extracurricular, extracurricular activity, sports theater, until 6 to 7 o'clock. Rush home, quick dinner, shower. Then for the rest of the evening, work almost nonstop on homework, only finishing and heading to bed at 10.30 or later. We're making our kids, we're making our students in our image. In the image that despises our embodiment and all that it entails, I love the reference in the beginning to the Sabbath. It's not, not something we practice very well. I don't practice it very well. We're making, we're making um, others into our image instead of the image of the Son of Man. I think, says Capic, we have a massive problem, but it's not a time management issue. It's a theological and pastoral problem. He says... I'm convinced that only when we've grasped the implications of the humanity of Jesus will we be able to properly assess our own humanity. The doctrine that the word became flesh means that God himself affirms our flesh as good and that affirmation liberates us for apologizing about our creaturely limitations. If we believe that Jesus who is free from all sin was fully human then this means that he considered creaturely restrictions to be part of his good creation and not evil at all. It means that we must not apologize for what the Son of God freely embraces. So human beings are necessarily embodied. If we are embodied, we are necessarily limited. And thirdly and finally, if we are embodied and limited, we are dependent. Human persons are necessarily Dependent. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because Jennifer Marshall Patterson is going to talk about relationship, and I suspect there'll be a lot of overlap there. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of things and be done. We are, of course, dependent on God in whom we live and move and have our very being. No theist would deny that. But we are not independent, self-determining creatures any more than the infant Jesus was independent of Joseph and Mary's care, expressing his autonomy by changing his own diapers or even by offering informed consent for and determining his own post-procedure care plan after his circumcision. Autonomy is the, is the, um, is the, the, the trump 
in medicine. We, we, need, we need to be autonomous creatures. Autonomy is, at, at least enlightenment autonomy is a, a, a mythical creation of the human imagination. God himself said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him, a companion in a relationship of dependence on God and inter interdependence on one another. Last time, Capic, I think. No, I've got one more. Our bodies, with all their needs and dependencies, were made good. And part of the intrinsic good of our bodies is that they're an ever-present reminder of our creaturely needs. To be human is to be dependent on the Creator Lord, dependent on other human creatures who provide their presence and love, dependent on the earth, which provides for our physical needs, from oxygen to lettuce, from shade to springs of waters. This dependence, when recognized and remember, raises serious questions about the emphasis on self-generated identity that's so often assumed and encouraged in our modern world. As embodied finite creatures, we, uh, do we have a purely self-generated identity? How do I value my particularity without ignoring the countless ways my identity is given as much as it's self-created? Here's his illustration. Did Adam have a belly button? Well, I don't know and neither do you. But I'm pretty sure Jesus did. Born of a woman. He was human, and in his humanity, he was dependent on God and on Mary's body during gestation. And unless she needed a wet nurse, after his birth, he was dependent on her as well. His dependence on Mary was not a result of Adam and Eve's interdependent decision to disobey God. Remember, Eve's husband was there with her. They made that choice together. It was a necessary, that is, this, this dependence was a necessary aspect of humanity for he was begotten, not made. Um, he was made man. <laughs> Nothing is quite as ontologically revealing as our belly button, says Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon. It's our body's way of reminding us that we are not self-made people. We're not separate islands. We're not merely rugged individuals. <laughs> Capic tells the story of one of his soci sociology colleagues and friends at Covenant College, Matthew Voss, who's developed an exercise for his freshman students to help them think about their interconnectedness. He asked two students to stand up, one, one male, one female, asking them to introduce themselves. Simple. Right? I mean, you could do this, right? You, any, any student should be able to do that, introduce themselves. Here's the catch, though. They must not mention any groups to which they hold membership. So one student offers his name. Oops, that's membership in a family. Uh, oh, you're speaking English. That's membership in a language group. I like pizza is a membership in a group that likes pizza, especially college students. And even I'm just fine involves membership in a group of living things that know that they are I who is fine. You get it, right? We are more the product of things and people outside us than we are our own isolated, autonomous selves. And the implications here are, are thick, and I hope they can be drawn out better in some of our conversations. Let me just mention a couple. First of all, the values of the family unit. I remember teaching seminarians from China. Um, in a, um, this is not meant to be... Um, uh, um, I, I'll, I'll just say it, and you'll have to assess it as you will. But anyway, it was in a non-disclosed location in the United States where I was teaching seminarians uh, from China. And I remember talking to them about making ethical decisions um, uh, with their loved ones at the end of life. And they reminded me that it's the elders in the community who make those decisions. They reminded me that, that, that eldership in the family was a status that's not recognized in the uh, ideal realm of individual, rational, expressive agents. You ask the elders, what's the right thing to do? Reminds us of the importance of the common good over the individual good. The common good the good of humanity, the good of, the good of community, the good of, the good of a human 
uh, uh, of a church over the single, rational, autonomous, individual agent. Um, it also has implications, as I've alluded, uh, in, from Capic in, in the way we um, the way we handle our curriculum and our co-curriculum in our life together um, in embodied, limited, dependent relationships in the university and the seminary. And finally, I was reminded that there are some in, in, a, in, a, in a, a culture that, vo that values almost above everything else voluntariness the, the rational, autonomous individual has obligations only insofar as she or he uh, volunteers for those obligations. I was reminded that there are at least some of our dependencies and obligations are not chosen. I didn't choose to be my father's son. What I was called to honor my father. Some human dependencies and duties are not voluntary, not assumed. So finally, and, and I conclude in, in uh, 30 seconds, in addition to being imagers of God, what it means to be human necessarily means to be embodied, limited, and dependent. Given the Enlightenment model and the medical model, we're tempted to think we're tempted to think that advancing in health and maturity means that we grow out of those attribute, attributes of limitation and dependence and embodiment. We're going we're gonna to get better. We're going we're gonna to grow out of that. We're going to become, we're going to become adults. And so we think that the ideal for humanity is to become more cerebral, freer from limitations, independent. It's a half-truth that can lead us to believe a whole lie. Most of all, we depend on the Holy Spirit to teach us. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, be our teacher until we experience the consummation of our created humanity by returning to you, our God, embodied limited, dependent imagers of God. Through the incarnate Christ, we pray. Amen.